You may remember our main presenters from their talk in February to Atheists Go to Sunday School. They've been traveling around the different oases with their New Testament workshop that some of you may have attended yesterday. So please help me welcome back Rex Burks and Owen Younger. Thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you to everyone who came out yesterday. I know that, that three hours got flew by, but it was so much fun to go through that with you all. Uh, also, my sister Manette is here. It's her birthday. She's a first time visitor, so happy birthday. Show of hands, if you were here six months ago when we gave the talk about Sunday school, I was here. Okay, good. So we're going to briefly recap that. We're not going to repeat ourselves. Okay. 
So let's talk about claim one. So that was the last slide that's a review from last time. So right, right so this is it. Claim one, God is real, miracles are real. And, and with, this is a category, right? The, the, the assertion that Jesus is the risen son of the living God is an example of something that we might hear. Oh, 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 oh. Thank you. 
didn't have it. That's a different category uh, of claims. And the, the, the existence of evidence that there might have been a man named Jesus is in no way proof that he was the literal son of God. That's a different category. That's that the burden of proving that, that because it's a more extraordinary claim, is high. So this, we get to the claim number three. We're going to 
I'm trying to go through this pretty quick. Uh, God's plans are beautiful. How many Jesuses do we have? I think that's about four Jesuses. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you're counting Jesus. Uh, so, no, we say God's plans are often grotesque, arbitrary, and offensive. And, and in full disclosure, the first time we, we used that phrase in this presentation was actually at Methodist Church. And we had a Methodist coming up to us afterwards and said, yes, I agree. Grotesque. What, what is profound about this idea that some human sacrifice can be required in order to forgive us? Well, so sacrifice that sounds actually really very mean. That, that doesn't sound like a plan. I can imagine that a deity would say, you're forgiven and who for done. But that's not what we see in the orthodox understanding of poly Christianity. Well, we just see this picture. They tell us this is the most beautiful expression of the history. In the, in the history. Yeah. Right. And I, I have it in the worst time. Actually, help. 
dispel the rumor that Christianity is not hurting anyone. We, we want people to see this um, as something that we would be better off without. Right. And I, I'm going to start with worth winning. I'm going to start with this and emphasize this a couple of times. I would say that any Christian who's a good human being and wants to point to Christianity as the reason for that person being a good human being, I think that person is the point. I would argue that there is nothing positive that can be achieved through Christianity that could not also be achieved by secular humanist values, full stop. So let's go through these. I, first things first, I, everybody agrees that the bad stuff is bad. I'm not going to ask any Christian to act defend the Westboro Baptist Church. Right, so when you've got, when you've got priests raping children or, or picketing funerals or crashing airplanes in the buildings or the witch trials or the Inquisition, that's not the stuff we're talking about. Even Christians will tell you that's bad stuff. Purity, purity. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, the, the treatment of the LGBT 
So do you find more success in your uh, speaking engagements with Presbyterians and Episcopalians than you do with more fundamentalist groups? I think success is defined differently. I think when we're talking to fundamentalists, what we're trying to do is introduce, because it, it usually comes down to the Bible, right? So when we're talking to fundamentalists, we try to um, plant those seeds of doubt about the Bible, uh, specifically things like contradictions, things like contradictions between Paul and, and Matthew or between Mark and John. Those are the kinds of seeds that can erode that kind of fundamentalism. Um, when we're talking to more liberal Christians, it, it's different. It's, it's more focused on the heart, right? Because they think, well, I've already got rid of that fundamental stuff, but I'm not doing any hard. And we're trying to show, no, that you know, what we need to do on this planet is hindered by this. And so it's not about more or less success. It's about crafting the agenda to the different uh, beliefs of different denominations. And we're not in churches to try and talk people out of religion. We're actually there to ask questions. Why, uh, what do you believe about the New Testament? What do the documents mean to you? How does it inform your life? Now we have a question. When it comes to moral and social issues, isn't uh, modern Christianity more a religion of Paul than of Jesus? So that's an interesting question. I would argue uh, that. So um, there probably are other ways to get better at comforting each other and, and learn 
work to teach through that, love through that, help people through all kinds of difficult situations without perpetuating things that are just obviously untrue. Uh, so we, we would say, let's first decide what's true, and then let's find the most effective ways to, to help people live in the world with truth. There may have been than fairy tales that come from them. There may have been a time in human history with the belief in shit that clearly is in our brains. Sugar uh, would be bad for us to do. In the modern world, there are more responsible ways to 